Now before we actually get set up with Hibernate, it's a good idea to understand a little bit about the general architecture of Hibernate and how it works so that we can better understand what we're doing when we're using it. Here you can see a high level view of the Hibernate architecture. We start at an app that we create which interfaces with Hibernate. We have a persistent object in the middle here because the persistent object lives both in our application's code and in Hibernate since we define mapping files which map the data in our Java objects to fields in a relational database and Hibernate reads this mapping to know how to use our Java objects. We can also use annotations to achieve the same effect, but in this course we'll be using XML mapping files. Hibernate itself is a framework that is composed of multiple components, which we'll discuss in a minute. Hibernate interfaces with the database through JDBC, which is the standard way of accessing a database in Java. A configuration file is used to tell Hibernate what JDBC driver to use and what dialect to speak to the SQL database. For example, the SQL used to communicate with the SQL Server database is different than the SQL used to communicate with a MySQL database. Hibernate also uses JNDI and JTA for communicating with an application container like JBoss and managing transactions, but we aren't going to really get into those scenarios very much in this course. So Hibernate basically works by reading a configuration file which tells it what database to talk to and how to talk to it and then reading mapping files that tell it how to map Java objects to relational tables. You write Java code that uses the Hibernate API to do things like save or update your data or query objects from Hibernate. If we were to crack open the Hibernate box in the last slide, here's what we would see inside. Hibernate has a few main types of classes that you'll commonly deal with. First, we have the configuration class which is able to read a Hibernate configuration file and set up Hibernate. We need to create an instance of this class when we first start our application so that we can use Hibernate. Next, we have a session factory. The session factory basically is able to manage sessions for us. We need to get an instance of the session factory to be able to create and use sessions. We usually create a single instance of a session factory and hold on to it for the life of our application. Then, when we want to actually do some work with Hibernate, we ask the session factory for a session. We could execute Hibernate queries and commands directly in the session if we wanted to, but it is almost always a good idea to first ask the session to start a new transaction and then do our work, and when we're done, commit the transaction. So, we typically write all our Java code to actually work with the persistent object using the Hibernate API in the scope of a transaction using a session to interface with Hibernate. We can also use the query and criteria classes to query our database using a SQL-like syntax through the query class or a more object-oriented syntax through the criteria class.